Welcome to Building Legacies, a mother's financial influence and why it's important. Financial literacy is so important and it's because you want what's best for your children. It's a major component of creating an environment of success for not just current generations, but for future generations. And so when I was putting this presentation together, these two verses um, stood out to me. The first is Proverbs 22, 6, train up a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. The second is Proverbs 22, 7, which is the baseline scripture for my business. And it states, the rich ruleth over the poor and the borrower is servant to the lender. For me, these two scriptures really distilled down what our presentation will be about today. It's about training up your children, helping them recognize some of the traps and snares that the enemy puts in front of us, especially when it comes to finance, which is another reason that financial literacy is so, so very important. And moms, before social media influencers were a thing, you were the OG influencers and you still are. In fact, when it comes to finances, you have the most influence over your children. They're watching your money habits closely and what they see, they will pass on to future generations. I'm sure that if you take a moment to reflect on the habits that you saw your mother or your grandmother, or maybe an aunt, someone um, that was influential in your life, I'm, I'm certain that you can see some habits that they carried with them that you're probably enacting at this stage in your life. So my question to you as we begin this presentation and move forward, I'd like you to think about what habits you are exhibiting to your children that they're watching closely. What money habits do your kids see? And before we jump in any further, I'd like to introduce myself briefly. I'm Sarah Hobbs. I am a former banker. I have spent over 20 years in banking, 13 years in in the consumer side in the last seven years of my career was spent commercial lending. And what I saw during that time in banking was a consistent thread, a consistent undercurrent of a lack of financial literacy. And that really manifested itself in a number of different ways. Um, but typically it, it came down to people didn't necessarily know what questions to ask. They didn't have trusted financial advisors. Maybe they were picking up um, ideas and, and strategies from friends who were no more educated than they were. Um, and so I really felt called to come out of banking and, and create stewardship advisory services, which I founded in 2021. And what our focus is, is to empower all generations to be good stewards of God's resources. And I do that by providing practical methods for creating generational change through financial literacy education. And we partner with both families and individuals, those who understand that there is a need for financial literacy, but maybe they prefer not to go alone on the journey. Um, they see that education is a form of protection against this forceful push toward debt that's in our society. And there's a sense of urgency to pull out of a worldly financial system. The resource agencies are very much in the same lane. They are seeking ways to proactively offer financial literacy training for the communities that they serve and that they understand that there's a need to foster an understanding of the connection between financial literacy and effective kingdom stewardship. And that's really what is on our agenda today. We're, we're here to help facilitate change, generational change, make some some changes that will have some significant positive and enduring effects on all generations going forward. But first, we need to understand some things in order to be very effective at doing so. And the first is, what is the common bond? So what is spiritual warfare and its connection to debt and stewardship? What's the financial impact? So how does spiritual warfare show up in our finances and how does it influence stewardship? And what's the solution? So how do we create this long lasting change that we're seeking? How do we facilitate that change for generational impact?
So the first thing to know, and, and I know that I'm not speaking out of turn when I say that mothers as educators, you recognize the value and importance of education. So in order to be most impactful, we need to understand this connection between spiritual warfare, debt, and stewardship. There is a problem in our society with lack of financial education, and part of this lack in financial literacy is a failure to see that the enemy wants us to willingly walk back into bondage. So spiritual warfare is certainly connected to debt bondage, which in turn affects our ability to be effective kingdom stewards. So let's talk about spiritual warfare. What is that? Well, dictionary.com defines it as being a spiritual war ongoing for the hearts of man as the forces of evil want to turn us away from God and separate us from him. So the enemy will try any means possible to get in our finances, to cause us trouble, to cause us strife. Nothing is off limits to him, including money. But remember, of course, for those of us with God through Jesus Christ, our Savior. The battle is already won. J Jesus has already overcome death with the resurrection, so we can rest in that knowledge. Even so, the word is filled with references of being prepared and planning, and, and it gives us bountiful resources to draw from to help us see what some of these snares and traps of the enemy um, are being put in our path. So part of that is financial spiritual warfare. And I'd say that these three scriptures really give us an understanding of what we're facing. And, and that's part of wisdom, right? Knowing what we're up against. So these three scriptures will certainly shed some light on how spiritual warfare plays in our finances. And the first is Ephesians 6, 12. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. The second is John 10.10, 10, the thief cometh not, but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. And the last is Matthew 6.24, which states, no man can serve two masters for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. Ye cannot serve God and mammon. So Matthew 26 especially makes it abundantly clear that we have a choice to make. In all things, in all ways, in every aspect of our lives, we are making choices. And certainly that's true when it comes to finances. This scripture blatantly shows us that the way we choose to handle money, the way we choose to um, use the money that the Lord has entrusted us with is certainly an indication of who we are honoring. Are we serving God or are we serving mammon with our financial choices? And what is mammon? Well, mammon looks like greed. It looks like evil. It looks like corruption. It's using the wealth that God has entrusted us with in corrupt and despicable ways. So the definition is riches or wealth regarded as a source of evil and corruption. It's wealth regarded as an evil influence or a false object of worship and devotion, covetousness. The enemy wants us to take what has been given to us, what's been entrusted to us by the Lord, by the Heavenly Father, what's been given to us to do good with and to use it for evil. So choosing to serve and love mammon, over choosing to serve and love the Lord is at the heart of financial spiritual warfare. And it certainly prevents us from being generous. In 2 Corinthians 9, 11 is a good example of that generous nature that we're taught to model our behaviors after Christ in all things. In generosity, unfortunately, when we're choosing mammon, over choosing to serve the Lord, it certainly impacts our ability to be good stewards of the kingdom of God. And financial warfare, 
when we make that decision to to choose to serve mammon with our financial choices, it shows up in our lives as financial warfare. So if you've ever felt like you're drowning in debt, you just can't get ahead, you're overworking because of debt, you're stuck, you feel like you can't save, you're embarrassed, you're ashamed, there's a bevy of emotions that's wrapped up in finances. Um, and these feelings certainly, in my perspective, line up with John 10.10. 10. The enemy wants to destroy everything. He wants to steal our freedom in Christ. So financial warfare can look like being overworked due to debt, spending too much time in social media and being deceived as a result of that, being dissatisfied with our lives. So we turn to materialism rather than turning to the Heavenly Father. We might manage our money unwisely. And certainly financial debt bondage is a big part of that as well. So how did we get to this point? How do we get to this financial warfare in our lives? Well, these are the three big culprits. It's certainly not an all-inclusive list, but these are the biggies. And remember, look at this presentation and, and keep this in the back of your mind that the enemy wants to separate us from God as part of spiritual warfare. And the money aspect is one tactic that the enemy employs to, to do that. Um, so the first, the first culprit is distraction. And, and I'm going to pick on social media. Um, social media is a huge distraction and it, it reaches all generations. So the daily average spent on social media for ages 16 to 24 is five hours and 49 minutes. Ages 45 to 54 spend three hours and 57 minutes. That is a lot of time. We well know that time is a diminishing asset. We've only been given so much of it, right? So every day that we're spending in front of social media is certainly not the best way for us to manage our time, to use our time wisely. And it can lead to the comparison game. I think we've all played this game at some point in our lives. Maybe some of us have spent more time there than others, but the comparison game is a game without a winner. Um, all that we see when we see social media influencers are these perfect, quote unquote, perfect lives. And when we begin to compare our lives, which don't look anything like these social media influencers post, that can lead to all sorts of feelings, anxiety, depression, dissatisfaction, um, again, I am reminded of John 10, 10, when I look at this and these feelings, all of these negative emotions can lead to impulse buying to fill a void. So instead of, again, this is a tactic of the enemy, instead of turning toward our heavenly father for that fulfillment, because we are distracted from him, because we are separated from him in some form or fashion, and we're spending all this time on social media, we're being influenced poorly. We're, we're being influenced in such a way that makes us feel even more alone and dissatisfied. And that impulse buying can certainly lead to debt bondage, which again is a way for us to willingly walk into bondage. And at the end of 2022, the Federal Reserve said that the total household debt had reached 16.9 trillion, of which credit card debt was 900 and 930.6 billion. That is such a large number. I have such a hard time stating that for a variety of reasons. And sadly, I know that that number has actually gone up. The first quarter of 2023 numbers were significant, significantly higher. And as we well know, debt is a slippery slope. If you get started down that path, it's so much easier to justify the reasons for us to stay in it, to continue to use it as a crutch. And suddenly you might find yourself in a debt cycle. So part of that Part of this debt cycle, part of all of this um, spiritual warfare and how it shows up in our finances. Of course, I mentioned that big tech is a big distraction. Our average daily screen time is seven hours and four minutes. Now that can be screen time for anything, not just social media. 85% of American adults go online every day. Sadly, I know that I'm in that category, 100% certainty. And there is 
a distinction between teens from lower income households and teens from higher income households, the amount of time that they're spending online, both of those numbers are extremely high. And it certainly goes to show us and makes us wonder how our teens are being influenced online and who is teaching our children and what are they being taught. And the comparison game, again, social media has a tremendous impact on children. Um, here are some stats. I won't take the time to go through all these, but you can certainly take a look, see, and see some of the significant impacts that social media has. And not just on children, but of course on adults as well. So these habits that children are picking up as they become young adults, as they become adults, um, they're carrying these things with us as well. It's a treacherous combo, the combination of big tech and this comparison game. And, and now we're seeing that 33% of consumers are going to social media to learn about brands and to purchase those goods. So not only are we in a perfectly poised situation to be influenced and play the comparison game, but now we have the quote unquote, convenience of being able to purchase those goods online. And it's becoming more and more common. In fact, social commerce sales are expected to exceed 56 billion this year in 2023. And 65% of consumers have made purchases through social media. That is a significant number. So we think about this perfect storm, and now we've got the rise of the buy now, pay later industry. Some of us may be more familiar with this in terms of um, six months, 0% financing that you might see at furniture store. It's the same concept, and it has grown exponentially in the past few years. In fact, between 2019 and 2021, this industry by now pay later has grown by 970%. And that same period saw an increase in the loan volume from $2 billion to $24.2 billion. It's sold, it's touted as a simple and easy interest-free way to make purchases, but unfortunately nobody reads the fine print. And when you are late with a payment for whatever reason, whether it's your fault or perhaps just a tech error or some, if your bank is down, something, you as the borrower are going to get hit with late fees. And 42% of users have made late payments. That's resulted in late fees, which equate to up to 25% of purchase price. And you will see these buy now, pay later, later vendors when you go to um, the shopping cart for online purchases. Some common brands are Zezzle, Affirm Pay, Pay in Four with PayPal. I can say that if if things seem to be too convenient, there's a reason for that. We end up in debt. We end up in some pretty tricky financial situations because of convenience, unfortunately. So all of this, the social media time, the big tech distractions, the dissatisfaction with our lives, buy now, pay later, we are being conditioned to believe that debt is a normal occurrence in life. Our children are being conditioned this way. And of course, all this time spent on social media and all this time now making it so easy for us to make purchases on social media, of course, financial institutions are paying attention and seeing some opportunity to capitalize on that revenue, on that potential revenue. So look at these numbers, U.S. banking, digital ad spending between 2020 and 2024. Look at the amount that it has grown. It is significant. It is significant. So think about the pop-ups that you see when you're online for advertisements, for credit cards, or for personal loans. It is everywhere. And Unfortunately, our children are not yet capable of separating. They don't necessarily understand the impact that marketing has. And I mean, as adults, do we really sometimes 
we get sucked in and pulled into these marketing tactics and suddenly we've made a choice that we potentially wouldn't have made had it not been for these advertisements. So all of this time online, listening to influencers, shopping online, it's all leading to debt conditioning. And what keeps us in this debt cycle? So if unfortunately we found ourselves to be involved in debt, what keeps us here? Certainly a lack of financial literacy is a huge part of what keeps us bound in this debt cycle. All of this debt conditioning and distraction and, and comparisons are teaching us nothing that's generating good fruit, really. Lack of financial literacy keeps us bound. And unfortunately, there are a lot of emotions that are tied up into this feeling that we don't understand. Shame, fear, peer pressure, lack of self-control, inexperience, modeling familial generational habits, all of these patterns can certainly lead to us staying in this debt cycle. Sometimes there's a lack of a desire to get out of a cycle. Maybe somebody recognizes that they need help, but they're afraid of the change. They're afraid to ask for help. Um, and unfortunately, you know, how are you supposed to change generational habits and patterns and create new financial habits if you don't know what you don't know? How can anyone be expected to make changes in life without the proper training, without the proper guidance. So, I mean, think about it. We're seeing peer pressure on all sides, social media being a big part of that. There's a lack of self-control. You're looking for the answer that you want, not necessarily the best solution. Maybe inexperience can lead you to thinking that an expert, quote unquote, is always looking out for your best interest when it comes to finances, which sadly is not necessarily the case. Doing it the way it's always been done, if you're rigid, if you're unwilling to listen to other options, um, that can certainly keep you in a debt cycle. And the enemy is in all of these emotions. And it does create these patterns, create strongholds. It creates a financial, spiritual stronghold, which is a habitual pattern of thought built into one's thought life. And Satan and his minions want to capture the minds of people. And part of this um, concern and this urgency to understand exactly what we're up against when it comes to spiritual warfare and debt bondage and stewardship Financial spiritual strongholds can impact all generations. It can certainly be habits and mindsets that are passed down from generation to generation. So moms, this is why you are so influential. You have so much um, ability to make positive changes. And I would wager that a lot of you have already if not all of you have already done something, have taken some steps toward creating positive generational financial change. So think about it though, as, as a habitual pattern of thought can be carried through, it's not just applied to the negative, it's also applied to the positive, which is what we want to focus on here. We want freedom from debt bondage. We want to make these changes that will have generational impact. Different habits will lead to different outcomes. Unfortunately, when we are enslaved in debt bondage, the enemy knows that we are less likely to focus on the Lord. We're less likely to focus on the good. We're exhausted. We're just trying to keep our heads above water. So lack of financial education is According to 80% of Americans, they say that it has led them to go into debt, to be victims to overpriced loans. They have a reluctance to invest their money. Um, this is according to GoBankingRates.com. Financial vulnerability, 68% believe their lack of financial education as young adults has caused problems. Again, keeping open lines of communication within family is certainly one of the ways that we can tackle this. 23% of U.S. adults aged 
18 to 29 have credit card debt that's over 90 days past due. So already we're seeing some patterns here young adults who may not have been equipped with financial literacy education have now gone out into a world where they've been conditioned to think that debt is a rite of passage. And now we're seeing some negative outcomes of that. And I wonder what that 90 day past due status is in what way is that showing up in the rest of their lives? How is this showing up? And one in five, 18 to 24 year olds have debt in collections. Again, how is finance, how is money showing up in the rest of, of their lives? And you think about money is when things are going well, when money is coming in, the things that need to be taken care of and handled typically are under the rug, right? The minute you have money troubles, all of these other things, all of these other issues in your life come to the forefront and it can really be a crucible for all sorts of, of negative emotions and negative situations. But again, remember for those of us who have Jesus Christ in our lives as our Lord and savior, he's or already overcome. We're walking in him and we need to, we need to remember that. And that's part of the message that we should be communicating to our children, to the young adults in our lives. So think about it. If debt is such a problem, why isn't there a greater focus on financial literacy? Well, there's a lot of money to be made. And this case study, which was done um, with information from the fourth quarter 2022 earnings report, certainly gives us a little bit of clarity and understanding and how much money is to be made when it comes to debt. So the net income for fourth quarter, October through December of 2022, was $4.5 billion. The net income, of course, is the amount of income after any expenses have been deducted. Card services and auto net revenue was $5.6 billion, which is an increase of 12% over third quarter in 2022. This quote came from that report. The 12% increase was predominantly driven by higher card services, net interest income on higher revolving balances. What does that mean? It means that more people are carrying balances on their credit card. In fact, 12% more were carrying balances on their credit card, which resulted in higher interest income earnings for JP Morgan Chase Bank, which is the largest credit card issuer in the country. And part of what um, financial literacy education is about is knowing where to look for this information and employing some critical thinking skills and using the tools and resources that we have available to us. So JP Morgan Chase is a publicly traded financial institution, which means that by law they're required to provide their earnings reports um, and other documentation as well to the public. So you can actually locate any of this information yourselves online by just doing a quick search um, and typically put the name of the bank and type in earnings report and that should at least get you started. But it's important to understand how much money is involved in the lack of financial literacy education. I mean, and, and think about the timing of these things too. And again, I go back to marketing and, and how important it is for all of us to be aware of the vital role that marketing plays in coloring our financial choices. So fourth quarter earnings were up 12% over third quarter. So what are most consumers doing in fourth quarter? They're doing a lot of Christmas shopping, right? And so you think about ads that start really back in September and October. So now we see that there's a correlation between spending higher balances on credit cards, marketing ads. It is a significant push and we are bombarded on all sides by it again, which is why financial literacy is so important. There's a debt pandemic. I mean, look at these 2022 fourth quarter statistics, the balances on mortgages, credit cards, auto loans, consumer loans, student loan balances. Look at these numbers. It's baffling. It's mind blowing. It's shocking to me. 
It is shocking to me. This doesn't have to be the way that it is. Debt's not a rite of passage. No matter what, no matter what we are taught, it is not a rite of passage. It does not have to be so. And remember, when we are in debt, that is part of the financial spiritual warfare. It affects our ability to be good stewards for the kingdom of God. It affects our ability to have fellowship with the Lord. When we're drowning in debt, our thought life becomes consumed by it. It can actually be um, a cause for us being distracted from God and may inhibit or affect our desire to rely on him, uh, which is a, a that's a big deal. It affects our freedom when we have excessive debt in our lives. It forces us to change how we spend our time, which, of course, we remember is a diminishing access. It limits our freedom. It inhibits us from occupying the purpose that God has assigned to us. And it, it affects our ability to invest. So every dollar that's appointed to repayment of debt is one less dollar available to invest. And wealth building positively affects our personal households. And it also means through an attitude and spirit of generosity, we are to give. The more our household receives, the more we earn, we are to give that to the kingdom of God. And when we are affected with debt, we have less money to be able to do so. And remember, stewardship is the conducting, supervising, or managing of something that's been entrusted to our care. And remember that Everything belongs to the Lord, which is one of the reasons why the enemy comes so hard at money. Our ability to wisely manage the money that the Lord has entrusted us with is so threatening to the enemy. And keep these two scriptures in mind. 1 Corinthians 10, 26, for the earth is the Lord and all it contains. In John 10, 10, again, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came so that they would have life and have it abundantly. So everything belongs to God. The enemy is a thief. He is a liar. He wants our time. He wants our focus. He wants the money that the Lord has entrusted us to manage. And debt makes it hard to be wise money managers. It's one of the reasons that the enemy wants us enslaved in debt. Because again, orderly finances are a threat to the enemy. Money freed from debt, debt leads to financial health, opportunity for wealth creation, Wealth creation blesses your family and the families of those in the kingdom of God. And the less debt that we have as kingdom stewards, the more time that we have to fellowship with the Lord. And look at the threat of financial literacy. Look at, so in 2022, the average loss due to lack of financial education was $1,819. The people who were polled said that they made choices based on, solely on the fact that they weren't informed due to not having financial education. So they may have gotten into higher priced loans. They may have, have done some predatory lending, but they're saying that the average um, CNBC.com says the average loss is $1,819. So you take that money, you invest it for 12 months at 5% annual percentage yield, adding a hundred dollars each month, that money could have turned into $3,139.95. And again, look at the average credit card interest that's paid by U.S. households in 2022, $1,380. And we know that Americans are carrying balances on their credit cards more than they have in the past, unfortunately. So you take that amount of money and you invest that amount of money for 12 months at 5% with $100 added each month, and you would earn $2,678.49. This is from nerdwallet.com, this particular statistics. And there is a worksheet that I've added to the conference materials, um, and it has some interest calculators and those are what I use to determine these numbers. They're very helpful. And I suggest that you take a moment to look through those at your convenience just to get an idea of what you could be doing with some of this money um, if you invested it in a certain way. So remember that your kids are watching. They're watching how you save money, how you spend it, how you give it. 
if you worry about it, if you want more of it. So I urge you to examine yourselves for patterns that can lead to financial behaviors that can be troublesome, not only for your children, but for their children's children as well. And according to a recent survey, one third of millennials listed moms as their biggest financial influence. Again, you have so much influence. You're on the front lines with them every single day. And money habits are can be picked up very early, as young as age three, children can grasp simple money concepts. And some of these money habits are in place by age seven. Again, it's so important to understand the significance and the importance of financial literacy education in all things. So what's the solution? Take a preventative approach. Get in front of your kids now. Teach them some foundational skills that are necessary to navigate the financial world open lines of communication, build the foundation, teach your kids some basic banking and lending fundamentals, ask and talk to them about how financial institutions benefit from lending money, teach them the questions to ask and let them know that it's okay to say no. Let them know that it's okay if they're in front of a banker and they feel uncomfortable or they feel pressured that it's okay to say, you know, I'd like to think about this a little bit more. That's certainly something that is in line with what they're able to do. And teach budgeting. A budget's our roadmap. It tells us where we've been, where we are currently, where we're going. And it enhances our effectiveness as stewards for the kingdom. It's a form of defense and fear financial, spiritual warfare. Talk to them about saving and investing concepts like compounding interest, passive income, how to calculate return on investment. Talk about alternative ways to invest like entrepreneurship, starting a business, or perhaps real estate. Teach diversification and most importantly, model generosity in giving of time, money, and assets, because these are the things that will create enduring results. Children, young adults will learn a new way of doing things. They will develop positive financial habits that will affect generational cycles of debt and eradicate poverty and scarcity mindsets. There will be less distractions and more time, freedom from distractions. It will help us walk in the full understanding and the ability to occupy the unique role that God has set aside for us. And again, generational impact. You want to create a legacy for your children. You are building legacies for your children. Part of that is teaching them how to live free from the worldly financial system and focus on relationship with the Lord. So it's time. There's no time like the present to change financial mindsets and behaviors, to stop blindly accepting what the world calls the truth, and time to choose a life led and lived according to the word and not according to the world. So here are some of the solutions that we offer at Stewardship Advisory Services. And I'd like to leave you with these two slides. I've found both of these on social media, ironically, but the first is strong, um, seven, Strong's 517 references the Hebrew word meaning mother, which means the one who binds the family together. And on the right is a screenshot of some cute little ducks. The mother's heart is the child's schoolroom. So again, you're standing on the front lines. I applaud you for recognizing the importance of financial literacy in the lives of your children and future generations. And I want to thank you so much for your time today. Thank you for listening to this to, for listening to this presentation with an open heart. And if you are inclined to learn more about our programs, you can scan this QR code and be taken directly to our website. And again, we are here together, empowering generations to excel as kingdom asset managers. Thank you.